Okay, Dan, back to you. Uh, yeah, so we were talking about ergonomic brand checks for, in particular, this hash foo in object. Mm -hmm. And in a previous DC39 meeting, you, Mark, had made the point that if we, if we, I mean, we were thinking about under what conditions it may make sense to, <laughs> under what conditions it may make sense to, uh, to make it so that you have a reference to a private name. And I actually wrote up a gist where we would have this, a, a notion of a private name, but with limited capabilities, just an object that you could use to get or set or has check a private name, but without the ability to add it to objects. And I presented this to some, some colleagues in committee who were, there was very widespread skepticism that we should include something so sort of low powered and unergonomic. And people really eager to include sort of really exposing the full private name with the capability to add it to an instance and maybe even being a primitive. So Mark had previously said that this would not be permissible. And I wanted to dig into why to understand better. Because I said membranes, and they said, I'm not convinced. And so I don't know which order, I don't know if, if people are interested in that topic. So uh, the, um, uh, I'm interested, I'm not, I, I'm not at all uh, uh, aware of the recent conversations on this. Uh, so how people reacted to the membrane or how any of that conversation went, I have no, I, I'm completely ignorant of. Yeah, I mean, I don't have, I don't have a worked example written up about the, the membrane issue, but it seems pretty clear in my head. So, I'm, but I'm not sure which, conver which topic we want to start with now that we have like three topics. Okay, and do we have the, um, uh, Alex, did you um, have the list of TC39 proposals to, uh, uh, to review. Okay, good, good, very good. Yeah, they were just uh, further down in the uh, agendas. Uh, I'm sorry, our record of minutes, simply because we discussed them in previous meetings. <laughs> okay, um, so um, maybe we could just, uh, with this list in front of us, maybe we could do a quick triage and just see which of these things are um, uh, you know, uh, especially relevant to uh, discuss and then disc and then having collected them, then discuss our overall agenda for today. Sure. Um, I will take notes on our agenda. Okay. So the first one that I had listed here, by the way, I just took a look at the uh, list of proposed discussions for the September meeting. Um, none of these, as far as I know, are on this list. Okay. Are on, are on that list, I should say. Okay. So that may change, obviously. I'm not a member of TC39, but uh, no. yeah, about I'm not a participant. The, yeah, about half of the agenda at, uh, of the meeting actually happens on the uh, day of the deadline to post new agenda items. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, oh. so... Then, I do, I do want to suggest one other topic, which is the guards idea. Oh, yeah. Just that more. Good. Good. Okay. So we've got, um, uh, so, so we've got four things to, let me just make sure I'm, I'm not dropping. We've got four things to examine. Uh, there's the, um, uh, the same key. There's the reified name and what powers it should have. Um, uh, there's, um, uh, uh, what was it that you just mentioned, Dan? I mentioned guards, and before that, there was the temples, whether they're objects thing. Right, and and uh, okay, and then there's uh, uh, doing a triage on the TC39 proposals. Okay. For that last one, I suggest we time box it at 30 minutes. Otherwise, we could easily run out of time for these others. Okay, so let's let's quickly just um, eyeball this thing, and uh, anybody speak up for any proposal that's uh, here that you think would be uh, especially opportune to talk about. Um, oh, well, off the bat, I think that we should probably discuss the status of the CES proposal. Ah. 
Yes. Okay. I'm going to start a timer just to make sure that we don't lose track of the, um, since I wanted to keep it to 30 minutes or less to let other topics happen. Well, oh, we could also discuss the relationship between this group and the security TG. So, um, yeah, so for, is there progress? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I shouldn't dive into it. Yes, we should discuss that. Noted. So I'm driving the screen, but who's driving the conversation? <laughs> uh, put, put the list of proposals back up. Okay. Yeah, Mark, Mark's driving, I'm note taking, and you are the keyboard and cursor. Okay, Alex. so uh, of the things here, the ones that I think, um, well, there's the issue about what to talk about, what, what's important for this team to talk about in general, and there's what's, what's, and then there's weighting that by urgency of what's, opportunity to talk about in this meeting, since this meeting has now has uh, very quickly a substantial agenda. Um, so we already added SES. Uh, uh, Read-only collections and the records and tuples thing uh, and the same key thing, I think will all end up being closely related. Uh, so I would go ahead and keep read-only collections in mind when we, as part of the discussion about uh, records and tuples and same key. Um, uh, the uh, um fails fast, um, not this meeting, but certainly important. Um, what is async initialization? For, for a constructor that's async. Oh, 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 got I think, it. I think that proposal is really, it's a really interesting area, but I can't think of a protocol that would work. I don't know if somebody else had an idea for it. It's been a very long time since I've thought about that. Um, and uh, defensible classes is uh, also something certainly important for this group to talk about, but we don't need to do it today. Uh, and I don't see anything else. Obviously compartments, but not, but again, no, no need for it today that I know of. Beyond talking about CES in general. Sounds like we should stick to assess and read only collections then just to make sure we fit it within those 30 minutes that I asked for. Yep. Okay, which one do you wanna do first, Mark? So I'm gonna do the read only collections as part of the, the later discussion of uh, records, tuples and same key. So let's, uh, so, uh, so uh, Chris, it's over to you for discussing CES. Sure, um, yeah, so the CES proposal as written is very stale at the moment, if, if I recall correctly, I haven't looked at it recently, but uh, I think that we need to re-architect the CES proposal as an aggregator for its composite proposals, um, realms, compartments, etc., cetera, um, yeah. and lockdown, yes. Uh, and then of course the compartments module layer, which might be separable. Um, probably is separable. Uh, yeah, uh, and within that, uh, the running out ahead in the session implementation, there are um, a few noteworthy changes to the compartments API that would be worth discussing in this meeting, like the addition of the mod, well, I think we've already discussed the module method pretty thoroughly. Um, I have a proposal that we rename import hook to load hook, which is something we should visit in this group. Um, and recently we added a uh, module map hook um, to make the module map extensible dynamically. Um, uh, and I think that's where it is at the moment. Uh, the CES shim repository itself, its documentation uh, tree uh, reflects the state of the shim when it was based off of realms and evaluators. Um, and the, we probably need to recompose that in, in parallel. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> that, that's the status there, I think. Um, and of course, 
uh, volunteers would be very welcome. So with regard to the uh, API changes, uh, would you like to uh, project um, something to look at with regard to the API as you uh, would like to see it? Uh, I, I think um, what, what would be the best thing to project? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe the CES README is, I'm, I'm going to check right now and see if the CES README is up to date in this regard. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> We're supposed to uh, keep it in sync with the implementation, but uh, some things I remember and some things I don't. Uh, the new thing, oh yeah, and of course third-party module support we should discuss here too. Um, let's, uh, yeah, mod, mod, the mod, mod, no, we have, we have nothing to share. Uh, the module map hook isn't documented here yet, uh, but we have an issue for it. The, um, the third-party module API is written down here. Um, I can show that. Do you want me to scroll to a particular part of this page? Uh, oh, no. No, let me, uh, I'll share mine. Yeah. Uh, the resolve hook would fit in this position. Uh, pardon, the, the module map hook is an additional hook here that serves to uh, serves as a, a fallback that makes uh, this extensible effectively. Um, the third party module uh, support that we've put together um, has a, a, a is, a, a, is it, it changes the static module record from not, uh, well, it, it, it extends the API such that in any place that a static module record worked before, a static module record implementation of that interface uh, can go as well um, uh, and doesn't have a complete, uh, it doesn't have complete parity with what's possible in ESM, but should be sufficient for common JS, WASM, and other third-party module systems that don't require intermodule live bindings. Um, and within that subset, uh, you implement an object that has an imports array and an execute method. The imports array is used by the loader, uh, regardless of whether it's an implementation of the interface or a concrete static, an opaque static module, module record for ESM. Um, and then on the execution phase, you can implement an execute method which receives the, uh, the proxied exports object, uh, not the exports proxy object. So you, you're getting the mutable internal view of uh, your module namespace, which is distinct from the one that you would get from compar uh, compartment.module. Um, and uh, you also receive the compartment object and uh, a map, uh, an object that relates the imports from your imports array to the corresponding resolved imports in the context of the compartment that you're executing in, which may vary from compartment to compartment based off of the resolve hook. Um, the, yeah, and that, it, that so, so it's your obligation within this execute callback effectively to, uh, to uh, punch whatever exports you wish into the exports object um, following the conventions of ESM and uh, and uh, and then um, uh, and you have access to the compartment, the containing compartment in your uh, resolved imports. If you wish, if you need to be able to link to uh, modules in the same compartment, uh, some wiggle room exists that allows you to import things that are not actually declared to be imported by your module, which is something we might want to clamp down. Um, but that would require passing something other than the com containing compartment object as an argument. Um, what is the, uh, this one's unfamiliar to me. What's the, uh, what uh, the, the yeah, the, the restrictions. So the API as written is, uh, in, in session today, um, 
which be, is a, a straw man for the proposal, um, is that you receive in your execute function the compartment that you're executing within. Um, and that is, a cap that, is, uh, that is intended as a capability to call import now on the, um, on the resolved module specifiers corresponding to the imports in your imports array. Um, but it doesn't fall, it, it, is, it doesn't constrain you sufficiently to prevent you from importing other things, um, which is something that we may or may not want to address. Okay, they still have to be importable by that compartment, which is based on the configuration of the compartment. You can't cause yes. the compartment to import things that it wasn't set up to import. That's right. But you can still import things that the individual module within the compartment is mm -hmm. not, not statically declared to be imported. To be right, imported. and okay. if you fail to mention uh, one of your shallow imports in your imports array, that does not guarantee that it's not importable either. Um, and uh, Oh, where and, and the opposite as well. It is possible. So it is, but it is possible to omit something from your imports array and for it to still work. Um, yeah. Got it. Got it. Uh, yeah, which is um, I, I I ran with it because it was simple and probably not a problem. Um, it, it's just like dynamic import. There's nothing preventing you from using dynamic import to import something that wouldn't. That, that that would it would fail to load. That's a good point. Yes, the fact that 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 dynamic import is limited only by your compartment uh, does kind of establish that as a unit of protection for importability. The compartment is the unit. The module is not the unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so yeah. So I'm I'm having the same reaction that this is fine. Um, the um, uh, on the live bindings, I want to. Has anybody here ever encountered a live binding in the wild? Something that somebody was actually using on purpose for reasons other than testing the mechanism of live bindings? Okay, I'm not surprised. Um, uh, so we are going to be supporting live bindings for e direct ESM to ESM linkage, including across compartments. Uh, but we're, we're treating it as a anomaly uh, such that anytime you get beyond just direct ESM to ESM, uh, we're not going to be supporting live bindings. And I think that's, I think that's, that's probably a fine place to stand. And is adequately compatible with the uh, current module spec, the current ECMAScript yeah. spec. Yeah, and I feel that if we attempted to create a uh, uh, first class or second class, I don't. If we were to create an API that allowed um, third-party modules to interact with live bindings. Um, that there's a strong possibility, I'm sure, that that would interfere with the way ESM has been implemented by um, uh, by implementation, since they are at liberty to um, since they are at liberty to implement live bindings very differently from our shim. They can um, a, a native ESM implementation can effectively treat any binding as a shared scope, uh, in which case they don't need to um, propagate it the way we do. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so that, um, yeah. Yeah, I just want to d double check the semantics of having a record argument, the module map, backed by a function, uh, just to, to uh, double check my understanding. Uh, the idea is that the record provides sort of a first declarative statement of the contents. Um, and then the, um, the, the function, the hook, uh, is a procedural extension of that. And being a procedural extension can thereby be lazy. But that the framework around both the object and the function, because the object itself can also not be declarative. It could, it could actually be a proxy, or the properties could be, could be accessor properties, or it could just you know, be mutated um, while in progress in, in other ways. So that the semantics around both is that um, uh, for both the object and the function, 
it's only ever asked one question at most once. Uh, and then the framework memoizes the, the answer to that question, so that question is never asked again. If you never that's ask correct. the same question twice, then you can't get inconsistent answers. Uh, that's correct. Uh, let me clarify that the SES shim implementation takes a snapshot of the uh, of the module's object initially. Um, I will have to verify that, but I believe that it takes an initial snapshot, which means that it 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 exhaustively checks all of the uh, all of the properties of that object uh, during the constructor and never asks again. Okay. Um, and then, if there is anything missing in there, uh, it will ask the question of the module map hook uh, for any particular key once in mm -hmm. that compartment. Mm -hmm. okay, very good. Um, right. How that lines up with the uh, the, the fact that you're out, that you're walking the the map the declarative map up front. Um, uh, do you know how that aligns with what Modable implemented? I haven't checked. Okay. Uh, let's see. So uh, this third-party module support that we've added is a sufficient basis for us to create an interpretation of how to link against common JS. Um, however, it is not sufficient to create an interpretation of how to link against common JS that is shared with node. Um, uh, because node uh, hard stop treats common JS modules as a synchronous loading mechanism that can't be hosted by the compartment API. Um, and on that note, uh, the create the addition of of top level await would impact this API for third party modules. As specifically, the execute method would be um, allowed, if not required, to return a promise. Um, there, and I imagine that it might be that it's be it, the behavior of the compartment might uh, be parameterized on whether execute returns a promise or not, so that it can detect whether the module is. Um, using top level await or not. Um, my understanding is that ESM does treat those cases as different um, insofar as that synchronous, uh, uh, synchronous subsets of the module graph. I wish Bradley were here to say oh, for sure. Bradley is here. Bradley, I believe, <laughs> I, my understanding is that, uh, uh, that synchronous subsets of the module graph um, that can be executed synchronously are Yes, they are, and they actually even expose a flag that they are ah. synchronous. Um, how do they expose that flag? It is currently an internal slot. <laughs> um, I, I don't think anybody would object to exposing it, honestly. It's just not used anywhere. Hi. Uh, and it's an internal slot on what? On the space uh, object? I think it's in source text module record or cyclic module record. Okay, so it's on an internal slot of an object that's not reified in JavaScript. Correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Right. Uh, gentlemen, uh, just a reminder, we did want to talk about read-only collections. Uh, according to the time box I proposed, we have just over 11 minutes to do so. Okay, okay. well, I think that we've covered this in summary. Um, and we can revisit it in any topics that we need to in depth in the future. Um, Bradley, do you think there's anything more to squeeze from this discussion right now? Uh, no, I haven't had enough time to devote to this to say anymore. Okay, cool. I think that um, before we discuss this, I think that uh, uh, it'll it's on our onus to produce um, pull requests that we can look at together uh, against the TC39 proposal. Um, the compartment's proposal is very much a sketch at the moment. Um, so before we uh, make progress toward advancing or, or make progress toward discussing at TC39, I think that we, uh, you and I, Bradley, at least need to um, put some time into making that more complete. I'd agree. I can set aside time starting next week. 
Cool. All right, uh, Alex, the floor, uh, I, I give the floor back to you. <laughs> oh, very good. Okay, so um, uh, read-only collections uh, and how this fits with the object view of, um, of shallowly immutable identity-free objects, i.e. The, the, where records and tuples are gone. Um, so, uh, the, so the idea is that we take, we take um, this th these three methods a snapshot, diverge, and read-only view, and we make them, uh, um, we add those three methods to all of our normal collection types. And what a normal collection type is, is something to be negotiated, but it includes at least map and set. Um, uh, and if you do a, um, so right now we've got um, uh, the only maps and sets we've got are the ones that are mutable. Uh, the idea would be that if you do a snapshot on a mutable one, that you get a shallowly immutable one uh, that is structurally compared. And this really forces this issue of um, the conflict between um, uh, uh, order insensitive comparison versus having keys that cannot be canonically sorted. Uh, maps themselves already have keys that cannot be canonically sorted. The, the keys are, you know, include uh, objects, you know, normal objects of genuine identity. Um, I would want the, given this reconciliation across the proposals, I would want a snapshotted map to continue to have all of the same keys but be compared structurally. So obviously the structural comparison that's order insensitive cannot be the object is same value comparison because, because same value implies that it's um, uh, computationally identical in all ways, that there can't be an observable difference. Uh, so uh, that one would still need to be order sensitive. Um, uh, but the key thing is that right now, all of our, well, all of our normal collections, let's say, um, meaning maps and sets, uh, compare using same value zero. And same value zero is, unlike triple equals, same value zero is an equivalence class. And it is an equivalence class that's less precise than same value. It folds zero and minus zero together. So it would be consistent with uh, that to say that all of our normal collections where they currently specify same value zero instead specify same key. Uh, and that um, when uh, same key is applied to two const maps, two snapshotted maps, uh, that uh, it does a structural content comparison in an order independent manner and, uh, it, and therefore, you've got this nice um, sort of recursive coherence to it, which is the collections are compared by same key, and the collections compare using same key. Um, uh, um, and that uh, if we do that, then the, the issue of uh, allowing um, uh, um, symbols as keys is, is obviously, uh, no, there's no way in which it's any more prob problematic than allowing genuine object identities as keys. So this would take care of both of those. The purpose of having a snapshot, I presume, is so that a map that is used as a key uh, will continue to be able to retrieve the same corresponding value regardless of any, well, it, it prevents any possible mutations that would cause them to, to, um, to hash differently. 
Well, also the the if it's going to be structurally compared, then the map is identical to a copy of itself. It can't be distinguished from a copy of itself. Um, uh, and uh, and if it were mutated, if you, then then it would come to diverge from the copy of itself. So the idea is that the same key test must must be a stable test. Anything that we that we're going to use as an equivalence class for purposes of key lookup should itself be a stable test, so that uh, uh, two things that would you know where one key would have looked up an association, a mutation should not change the key in such a way that it no longer looks up the same association. So a snapshot would effectively be immutable, right? Until you call diverge on that immutable thing. Right. The snapshot itself uh, is shallowly mutable. The, the key value mapping is stable forever. And diverge makes a new mutable one. It does not change the immutable. And likewise, snapshot does not change the mutable one. Snapshot makes a new shallowly immutable. So, so snapshot is expected to be a linear time operation. There's no expectation that it may be done more cheaply. The um, uh, that's a very good question. Um, what I have done in the past in some languages uh, is uh, to actually do it as a as a um, constant oh, yeah. time or log time operation, uh, and I would I would encourage. Uh, at least no worse than log time, but I would not mandate it. Um, the, so that, that may be a little bit challenging to transition from an identity-based object to an identity-less object in less than linear time if we expect reliable hash consing. I mean, we could do the hash consing lazily, but that may require additional indirections in the, you know, in the in-memory format, so which I could make lookup slower. So I'm, I'm content to leave this uh, to the uh, judgment of implementations. I'm not sure as a standards body what we should be saying about what things are expected to have what complexity. Well, I, I just think we have to make sure that whatever API we design is feasible with the uh, performance that use cases would require, that we don't design something that's so fancy that it's going to be too slow to make practical. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the thing that I think, um, okay, so here's, the, here's, a, um, here's an API design issue that I think determines the other one, which is uh, given that I have got a big um, const object, big shallowly immutable collection, and now I want to make one that's like it, but a little different. Uh, if I've got a, um, you know, new operations uh, uh, like a, a analog of set that makes a new one that's like the old one, except one, one association is different and that those things are fast, uh, then uh, I think there's no urgency in having snapshot itself be fast. On the other hand, if the only way to make a new one that's like an old one is to take the old one and do a diverge on it, make the mutation and then do, do a snapshot on that, uh, then that would say that the diverge, diverge mutate snapshot, uh, that would put a lot of pressure on that to be cheap. So uh, the current read-only collections proposal does not actually propose the functional equivalent of the mutation operation. Um, uh, and I think they're probably a good idea anyway. Uh, and with them proposed, I would not, I would think it's not, not terrible for snapshot and diverge themselves to be linear time operations. We have a oh, I get Bradley. Yeah, so we do have some practical experience with copy operations on collections being problematic. We actually do quite a lot of copy operations of set in particular in node internals. Um, and that requires us to essentially do a linear time operation currently. Um, it's not really problematic enough for us to complain even now, but we could avoid the entire copy operation for most of these 
when we know it's a, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, a well-known set that should never change. Like there are some conditions and things we pass around that we copy when we never need to. So what, what, what I'm suggesting is that once you've made a snapshot, I'll, I'll get, get to you in a moment, Chris. Once you've made a snapshot, then you have uh, what I'll go ahead and, and just call a const set, so a shallowly immutable identity free set. And that if we've got these um, functional um, uh, things for creating a derived one from an old one, uh, 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 that's and the, the analog of the mutation operations, that those things I would think really do need to be efficient. They really do need to be, uh, you know, uh, expected to be log bounded, um, you know, not proportional, you know, proportional to no worse than the log of the size of the set. Um, and uh, as long as that's the case, once you're in the, cons the world of const sets, then uh, the full copy to get from the normal set into the const set and the normal copy to go the other way, the, the, the overhead of the snapshot and diverge, uh, would it be okay for those to be full copy costs if you could avoid the if you could avoid any further copies once you were in the world of const sets? And uh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, uh, I had a very simple question for Bradley. Where is the raise hand button? It's in the participants list for whatever reason. Uh, I am looking at that. Maybe if it's you're a... the host, you cannot use it. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> What's a, wow. Well, I guess it's not so good to be king. <laughs> uh, yeah, they assume you should just interrupt like I'm doing, so just do that. <laughs> well, I will be uh, doing that from now on. <laughs> speaking of speaking of interruptions, time has expired on the uh, on the proposal reviews. Thank you. I think that it's okay for us to continue with this. We can. This one was a crossover topic, anyway, because it, re it relates to the to the whole um, immutable, shallowly immutable object thing. Yeah, while this conversation was going on, there are a couple of pieces of, well, I mean, the hash tries are, of course, a very reasonable data structure for the snapshots since they have that property of being able to do um, fast mutations to immutable objects with lots of shared data. Um, so, I imagine that this, yeah, I, I mean, I, I imagine that snapshots carry with them the implication, uh, if if uh, specif if we specify a set carry the imp implication that we would be signing up implementers to to implement them as hash hash tries. Um, the another thing that occurred to me was that uh, the hash for a map could be incrementally kept up to date um, in a way that is agnostic to insertion order, um, just by zoring the hashes of the uh, uh, the mm -hmm. constituents as they enter and exit. Um, sort of as a, 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 a cheap but symmetric um, hashing algorithm. That's really nice. It's not just that you need associative and commutative, uh, you need reversibility, and XOR gives you all of that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I wonder. I, I, I think that I agree that yeah. Oh, uh, as Bradley was saying, we just, uh, or pardon, as Daniel was saying, we um, need to have enough in the footnotes to suggest that this could be done fast, um, but without specifying how. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even sure if it belongs in the footnotes, but just a practical discussion with a variety of implementers to make sure that, mm -hmm. you know, in practice, this works out. That's something that I'm trying to do for records and tuples now. And uh, but that's just a different data structure from read-only collections, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then let's uh, return to the agenda, shall we? Uh, let's see. Uh, let's. Uh, um, Daniel, do you have we given enough floor time to the topic of ergonomic brand checks, or is that something that we can revisit now? Uh, we didn't really discuss it yet, but I don't know if we need to discuss it before or after other topics. At the top of the list, uh, uh, rolled into 
Um, I assume, uh, is this an overlapping topic with uh, uh, records, tuples, etc.? Records, tuples. No, it's a separate. It's a separate topic, but I think it's okay. kind of lower priority. Since All right. It's well, like less cross cutting. Cool. Then let's uh, let's um, segue into uh, uh, same key read only collections and records or tuples in whatever order the floor wishes to pursue them. I, I think that's what we were just talking about. The same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, right. So, so previously, we had been thinking about permanently ruling out symbols as as record keys, because we we became pretty confident that we wouldn't find a way to sort the symbols. This same key thing kind of upsets that. So we actually had this idea of records having a non-null prototype, so that they would defer symbol property lookups to their prototype because we were reasoning that records would never have symbol keys. If we may be content with this same key story where records are maybe not sorted, but compared key in a key agnostic way, that totally changes the equation. You, you don't mean key agnostic, you mean uh, order agnostic. Order, order agnostic, yeah. Of course the key is part of the, the key okay. <laughs> for the aggregate value, yeah. Good. So how should we evaluate this kind of trade-off? Like I haven't brought this idea to the camping group yet. So one of my unvoiced complaints about order is uh, if you get a record and you add a field, the order in which the fields in particular are added is important currently. And so when you are it's not really mutating, but producing new records, you have to be very careful that you, A, have the uh, correct ordering, or B, if you are adding a field, that it is added in the correct place. If you don't have it in the correct ordering, you need to copy all the key value pairs to produce the correct ordering later on. And that is something that I don't want to approach from a syntax perspective and it is very awkward to figure out or debug. At least I think so. I'm, I'm having trouble understanding. Do you mean? I can uh, be more concrete. That's always easier. Uh, let's say we have a record which has a field A and we're adding the field B to it. Um, so now we have a record a, B ordered, and then we get a record that contains B, so we want to add A to it to match the uh, type of the first record. So now we actually have to be careful not to append to the one that only contains B. We must produce a new record with the A we are generating and then append B onto it afterwards. So I guess the presumption is that we would be comfortable with this approach of same key if uh, we think people actually use triple equals. Uh, if we think that people need to use object is, then that makes this whole thing fall over. So like, if you have to, if you have to worry about the order, then we're, this approach doesn't make sense. Mark? Yeah, I, 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 same point as Daniel, but I'm confused about what Bradley's saying. Because it sounded like he was, Bradley, I'm confused about the tense of what you're saying. The, um, right now, we don't have records. And the records that have always been proposed were ones that would compare, um, you know, which always had a, sort, a, a canonical order independent of how you constructed them uh, so that they would compare in an order independent manner. So having the records compare order independent had always been a feature. Uh, and same key just makes it compare order independent by other means. So I'm not sure when the case that you're worried about comes up. I think I might just be misremembering how it worked. If they're not, if the ordering of construction doesn't matter, then my concern goes away. Okay. Alex? 
Uh, yeah, just a quick clarification. You were mentioning appending item, uh, appending uh, keys and values to a record. I thought the records were defined as immutable and to begin with. Yes, that's an ease of terminology because stating all the process would be more verbose. Okay, I had to ask. Yeah, ma ma making a new one derived from the old one. Uh, we do need better terminology for uh, so to always speak clearly about when you're mutating something in place versus when you're doing an incremental derivation. Uh, Daniel? Uh, yeah, so if we, you know, I'm, I imagine we've been kind of talking about the, the case of building one uh, record from another using sp the spread operator. And that would kind of preserve the ordering. So the current records in Temple's proposal sorts the keys. So this isn't relevant. And with the with the same key idea, they wouldn't be sorted. But presumably, that would be because normal usages wouldn't care about the order, and they would instead just use triple equals, which would be still order independent. So if Bradley, if if you think you still would have to care about the order, if you think people would use object is or something else that would detect the order then I'd like to understand why so that uh, seems key to the trade-off. So I think that that is proven false by the ecosystem already with objects. Objects do have well-defined ordering. Uh, there were web compatibility problems with changing it to not a long time ago. I remember something about 4N, but uh, in reality, the order in which uh, fields are appended to objects is inconsistent at best across the ecosystem. I don't think it's something people should rely on. What, what are you saying? I feel like we're talking past each other. What are you mm -hmm. saying is proven false? I just don't understand how what you said relates I to what I was not, saying. I do not think we can make a reasonable argument that even though it would be an observable ordering, not through triple equals, um, I do not think we can state that it is problematic. Too much of existing code in the ecosystem does not uh, use that guarantee that exists on objects already. So I'm not talking about changing anything on objects. I'm just Correct. talking about so I don't understand how what I'm you're saying relates to records and tuples. We have an existing example of a structure that has an order of its fields, objects. Um, even though the programmers could rely on the order of the fields, it is extremely uh, frowned upon. I don't know how to put it simply is not unreliable in the ecosystem due to how people construct objects. So what does that mean about what we should do for records and tuples? I'm stating that I, any objection to it being unordered would not make sense to me. So, so I guess the, having the issue was is fine. I guess the issue was when you have keys that can't be compared. So for for maps that are deeply immutable, it's kind of obvious because you could have another, if you have a complex value as a key, then those don't have a clear comparison function. But even just for records, we have symbols as keys. So we've been ruling out symbols as, as record keys because of this uncomparability issue. And if we relaxed the requirement for comparability, we could have symbols as record keys, maybe. Just, just, just to clarify terminology, um, you, when you say uncomparability, they are comparable for equality. Uh, so I think you mean um, uh, the inability to order them. Uh, you're right. That's exactly what I mean. Uh, right. So unorderedness. I'm, could that I'm be... fine with that relaxation, just to be clear. Just so you're fine with... with Alex? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Bradley, are you saying you're fine either way with, you're fine with this uh, 
compare key or same key and unordered record um, change that was brought up? Yes. Okay, good, good. So let me just, you know, just, just to make sure there's no confusion, let me mention two constraints on language design that none of this violates, and I think it's important that none of this violates, uh, which is uh, there, uh, whenever you do enumerate, the enumeration order is always deterministic. Um, uh, and that uh, object is, is still a precise equivalence class uh, that um, uh, always distinguishes things which are observably different. Um, so that, um, so for example, two records that were the same according to the same key, but had different enumeration orders uh, would still be distinguished by object is. And I think that's fine. We don't have any collections that are indexed by object. I, I don't mean to um, ask for clarification, uh, but I missed the beginning of this uh, because I was um, meeting Renover. I understand same key, like I understand what you're implying by it. Uh, but I guess I, if do you have a 10 second summary of the intent behind same key, like why we would want to move to same key um, beyond like what it does? Uh, so it's already the case that our normal collections, maps and sets, uh, index according to an equivalence class, same value zero, that is less precise than the same value, less precise than object is, uh, that takes things which are observably, observably different and folds them together as indexing into the same bucket. Um, uh, as we introduce uh, objects that are shallowly immutable uh, and structurally compared rather than identity compared, um, uh, that introduces a new case that the collections have not previously encountered. So we could, without breaking any compatibility, uh, replace their, their use of same value zero with same key, and then have all of these new shallowly immutable objects uh, uh, index into collections according to same key equality, giving us that, um, that for most practical purposes, our comparisons are doing order independent comparisons, even though the precise observable semantics of the objects always continues to have a deterministic order and that those deterministic orders uh, uh, enable them to be precisely distinguished using object is. Okay, I think I understand now. Thank you. Uh, regarding the um, sorting of symbol keys, just as, a, as, as an aside, uh, I'm wondering if it would be practical to have a internal slash private field that could be defined for symbol keys and just be an, uh, a number that's incremented for each individual symbol as the symbols created. And Mark's shaking his head saying, hell no. Okay. Right. That hidden, hidden mutable state, uh, covert communications channel, um, uh, uh, breaks all of the uh, security isolation among subgraphs within the same realm. And in any case, it doesn't, if, if we want to generalize this to read only collections, uh, where you've got the keys can just be arbitrary objects with identity, uh, then uh, making some special case for sorting symbols doesn't help anyway. Oh, um, while Richard and Chip are both here and we're on this topic, um, uh, what do you guys think about adding a canonical JSON stringify? Uh, to the language. What do you uh, mean by that? So uh, Richard has defined a, a canonical JSON, uh, meaning that 
Uh, the, the semantics of JSON is order independent on the keys of, of records. Right. Um, uh, but um, given um, uh, um, you can't, if you had a way to stringify an object graph that was um, canonical, such that two semantically equivalent uh, JSON stringifications uh, uh, always uh, yes. turned yeah. into the same string. Having had to re-implement this myself more times than I can count, um, yes. Yes. I would very much like to have that. Yeah, and um, I would have to either borrow or re-implement it again. Uh, it keeps coming up, and for security purposes, uh, the ability to say all semantically equivalent JSON strings can be hashed to, an equi to, to a single hash would be very nice, and you'd like to do that not at the price of having to create an associated commutative hash. Right. Um, I think, um, um, and, and I think I think I've got an item on my um, to-do list that is kind of never making it to the top, which is to. Um, uh, I, I think it, I think it, the, a, a meeting a while ago. I don't remember whether it was one of these or it was the TC39 plenary to talk to Richard about uh, JSON APIs in general. Um, but I think uh, I think there's a there's a bunch of stuff that is sort of just this sort of this cloud of, of dangling issues that have been um, that are not they're not issues with JSON per se, but with the JSON APIs that that would address a lot of the things that people whine about with JSON. Um, um, I suspect. Um, uh, Having a canonical stringify um, is is sufficiently useful um, and sufficiently valuable that it probably would not be a good idea to hold up that for whatever other hypothetical wonderfulness we might want to improve in the API in general. Um, my only concern there is um, uh, one of the failure modes of TC39 is by uh, attacking things that are, um, that, that by, by using, by attacking things incrementally, which ought to be tackled uh, holistically, um, we often end up with uh, APIs and specifications which are considerably more complicated than would be ideal. Um, and I just assume not start another one of those exercises, but um, this is also, you know, perfect is the enemy of good problem as well. And uh, I think having a, a canonical JSON stringify would be good. That's my oh, uh, Just having interrupt with the joys of Java marshalling. Um, it, I think canonicalizing is good, but there may be uh, some fiddly bits about needing certain fields to be in the first position for other languages. I, I have actually, yes, I have actually done that. Um, uh, in fact, the, the, the very first JSON handling library ever written, um, which I did back at State Software back in 2001, um, um, it had exactly that property, which was just because of the use case we were using it, there were a couple of fields that would always come first. And this is strictly just to make things clean and legible for debugging purposes. It had no other motivation than that. Um, um, but so having had that having had that concern emerge early makes me sensitive to it. Um, this is actually if the type field is not at the top, some uh, marshalling libraries will fail. Okay, right now the JSON, the, uh, AP, the JavaScript JSON API gives you zero control yes. over the order of fields in a record. That's correct. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not true. The order of fields in the record are in uh, uh, enumeration order. So yes, well, you're right, you're right. Actually, yeah, it's, de it's deterministic, but it is not, is not subject to common author interfaces. Uh, maybe that's not quite true. Remember the two JSON method of, J of objects where you can return a different object and you could probably force a different ordering that way. Yes, I, sus I suspect that's true. 
Yeah. So Richard, you've written down a standard for a canonical JSON serialization. Um, I mean, a de facto standard. I mean, you've written down a document. Yes. Uh, and you've implemented it. Uh, would that document itself be suitable for de jure standardization? I believe so, subject to the tweak that we mentioned the last time this came up about not collapsing together negative zero with zero. Ah, that's, uh -huh. that's the one that's the one wart that I that I'm aware of within it. Okay. Good. Yeah, I mean. So, so I guess my take on this is, um, I, I think this is a fine idea. I'm not sure what the action item is, and if so, who would act upon it? Um, um, uh, although, if, if, if Richard wants to push, I will, I will cheer along on the sideline. So, yeah, the um, the possibilities that come to my mind. Number one is just you know propose an extension within ECMA two six two. Um, number two, pursue something outside of that, although I don't know if it would be in 404 or not. Uh, well, 404 specifies the, uh, the format of the JSON text itself. Um, it has nothing to say about APIs. Um, that, is, that actually is a way to approach canonical JSON, as you could, you could have in 404 a standard for um, uh, this is what a JSON string in canonical form looks like. Mm -hmm. mm. And then op option three would basically be similar to two, except through the IETF rather than through ECMA. Yeah, although I'd, I'd, I'd rather not do that just because we we had to do a lot of political wrangling to get the IETF and uh, ECMA uh, on the same page. Um, because the stuff that IETF was concerned with was, was, from my perspective, largely irrelevant, but we wanted the two, two standards documents to be perfectly consistent with each other. And we have achieved that. And um, I'd rather not open up opportunities for divergence, um, um, uh, and, and, and once again, I think I think I would I would be very reluctant to make any changes to 404 that are uh, anything other than um, uh, clarifications or advisories, um, the, the, because because interoperability uh, um, across across time, including with things which, which are in our past, uh, is important. Um, um, I'm not sure, I mean, specifying um, a canonicalization uh, at the uh, uh, output text level is relatively straightforward. You just, um, 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 is essentially two things. You get rid of all white space outside of uh, string literals and you require property names to be in Unicode lexicographical order. And I think, I think, oh, and there's probably uh, one or two yeah, there's, there's, bits there's like about, a few. About, about Unicode encoding inside the strings, which I just like, oh, fuck Unicode. Um, <laughs> but, the, but, you know, it, the, 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 basically, the Unicode people who worry about that have sorted that out, and whatever it is they figured out, that. Um, yeah, the, like the raw mechanics, I, I feel confident that yeah. like, we're in good shape on. It's just, it's a little bit weird to say this is a canonical representation of JSON, and then to define it inside of a particular language. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the way that Markham phrased it was a canonical JSON stringify, which is something which, when given um, uh, an object tree, will produce um, uh, a predictable 
uh, output text when subjected to, to json.stringify uh, that will be independent of um, yeah, like chron non chronological order of non properties. Non-semantic variations, yeah. yeah. I don't know what, um, does anyone else have thoughts on the best avenue for pursuing this? I just, I mean, I, I just want to, say a general preference that somehow it be pursued under TC39 would be my first choice. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, that would be my first choice as well. Um, um, and, and as I say, I have this constant approach avoidance thing that is partially driven by being over, you know, overly time committed um, with too many projects on my plate. And so it, it never gets to the front. Um, 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 and the other is, is um, things that I've wanted it to do for a long time and um, get, you know, tripping over on my own feet as far as the, um, the list of things you want versus the list of things that are easy to do quickly. And the things, list of things that I want um, have a lot of, and this needs to be figured out steps in them, um, which means they could take indefinitely long to get resolved. So despite Chip's objections, what I find most attractive is the idea of uh, starting not with the API, but starting with the grammar definition is to make, a, let's call it a variant of 404, so it's not part of 404 itself, if that, there's a political problem with that. But basically something that's sort of using the language and structure of 404 to just define what a canonical JSON string is, uh, where clearly, um, well a canonical JSON string is a JSON string. Um, uh, and then um, and then that because and that grammar definition does is language dependent. Uh, right. That, well what, one of the things that that, that 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 I've encouraged people to do is and, and this this applies to not just um, your concerns about canonicalization, but conventions for how you encode things which fit naturally into JSON but which are not part of the current API, including things like how you would deal with big integers or um, um, uh, and, and, and other things like that, where, where um, um, you know, basically exactly the set of stuff that Richard has been, been hammering on, um, um, where you can say, um, it's essentially a not exactly a language binding, say, from JavaScript to JSON, but close to that of, you know, a, a specification that says, and here is how we are going to interpret this set of JavaScript things um, as JSON and having just a standard, essentially serialization spec, which, which, which expresses um, how different types and different values get, get represented in this form, basically a, a, a formal mapping as opposed to merely um, uh, what, what the, um, um, the current JSON API spec does, which is mostly concerned with the programmatic interface. Um, the other thing which I would very much like on the other side is given records and tuples in the language, I would want something like JSON parse that produces a structure of records and tuples rather than a structure of mutable, mutable arrays and objects. Right. And that's the, that's something that, that drops naturally into the API um, uh, uh, side of things where you have a, a, a yeah. parse to immutable or parse to structs and tuples or whatever you want to name it. Um, um, and which in turn leads kind of naturally to wanting to have some of the other things that you, we were talking about earlier, where you have the ability to create a yeah. immutable form of a you know, thing, which was original, basically initialized a mutable thing to be the same as this immutable thing, but now it's mutable, but it's a separate thing um, and like that. But, but having a, um, a parser that can return structs and tuples um, is an obvious thing. And the, the, the 
the place where I get a little squirrely is um, um, the, the, the list of things that you might like to have in your toolbox starts to grow. And so the API complexity starts to grow. And there's at some point where you want to, to sit down and say, is there some coherent unifying framework for thinking of all, all of this to make it more easily understandable and make it um, not just be a giant bag of mud. Um, uh, uh, and um, at that point, you start slowing down the train because you're now you're trying to make it pretty uh, instead of being a giant bag of mud. And once again, I tend to get wrapped around the axle of how do I make it great as opposed to how do I just solve the problem? Um, and you know, and it may be that we just end up with you know a a, 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 a a box of miscellaneous JSON API, um, and that's just how it is. But yeah, that's the approach that I'm taking so far. Um, you know, my my definitively out of scope feature point, for example, has been streaming. Like, yes, I, uh, that, that's, I was just yeah. going to say, one thing I'd like is a streaming API. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've actually implemented a streaming API that is not ready for prime time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there, if I weren't going to go poke around on NPM, I'd probably find 26 of them. But um, 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 yeah, the list of, of wants is kind of large and open-ended. Um, and so we need some process for bringing any decisions to convergence and I don't have the time. So, um, all right, well, we've, we've definitely, we've ruled out um, as at least as a first choice ITF. So that's, that's progress in itself. Uh, I have a preference, at least, it, at least back to canonical form of it being language independent from the start, um, which I think, I think goes to maybe like a sister document to 404. How much trouble would that be? Sorry, 404. I mean, four. Yeah. So like, so leave 404 as it is, but introduce another one under the same working group. Um, Defining a, a canonical representation of arbitrary JSON. Yeah. Um, I think that's a fine idea. The, I, I could see a concern is that, that, that it's going to be a two page standards document. Um, and people are going to ask, well, why don't you just fold this in with 404? Um, um, and, you know, the answer being, because you know, I don't want to introduce things that introduce incompatibilities between uh, JSON stuff produced at time X and JSON stuff produced at time Y. It's uh, not compatibility. It's you're 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 taking the definition of JSON itself and not modifying it at all. You're adding a definition of canonical JSON. Uh, the definition you're adding is already. Uh, codifying the de facto standard. That right, right. In, 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 in the sense that um, um, if, if you're going to, in terms of what is the meaning of this JSON text, um, 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 you could do that. I mean, one of the, one of the recurring questions um, is, and, and this was actually one of the points of, of, of um, uh, let's we'll say discussion between me and some of the IETF folks was um, uh, the 404 explicitly takes, is explicitly agnostic, which is to say there is actually text that says, we are not taking a position on this with respect to the meaning of the ordering of properties in an object and uh, the, what you do if the same key occurs more than once. I would say um, that yeah, I would hope that canonical form would prohibit the same key appearing more than once. Yes. Indeed, indeed, and 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 um, 
uh, and there are, um, yeah, various, this is a point of potential incompatibility between various implementations of parsers because some of them will take whatever it saw for us, some of them will take whatever it saw last, some of them will throw an error. Um, 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 Canonical JSON doesn't change the spec of parsers at all. No, no. Uh, well, it doesn't change the spec of parsers um, um, okay. in the sense that it doesn't introduce any weird, it, 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 it forbids weird edge cases which parsers might trip over. Um, but it does, it does um, have consequences for, for uh, serializers or uh, stringifiers. Yes. Uh, yes. In fact, that's kind of the point. Um, uh, I like the idea of having, I think I may be coming around to the idea that maybe we do want to put this in 404. Um, 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 You know, and in, in the sense that it's, it, it, it kind of falls into the, the, the heading that you call normative optional, um, which is to say it doesn't actually impose um, a, a constraint, but it does say if you're going to do this thing, here's how you do it to remain compatible with um, Yeah, and it introduces a new name for the new concept that it's adding, and I like I like the name canonical JSON. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think it would be a very uh, since since you've already got all the other uh, uh, spec boilerplate around it and anything. I, I mean, it would probably literally in this case be half a page of text. Um, um, so it wouldn't be. It's, this is sort of like. We just first of all decide what we want, and then after that, it's all politics. Okay. Um, uh, what are the other agenda items we have? For, we have left. Yes. One moment. Let me pull up. Uh, we have. Uh, we've gotten through same key, uh, reified name, and what powers it should have. Are record records tuples or objects guards? and our relationship with the security uh, technical group. And we have just over a half an hour. Let's call it a half hour. Okay. Uh, Dan, has there been um, uh, any, any further progress with regard to forming a security technical group? There seemed to be a little spurt of activity That's after true. one of the incubator meetings. Then as far as I can tell, everything went idle. Uh, Dan, if you're trying to speak to us, you're on mute. By the way, by by, by the way of uh, pedanticism, the T in TC and the T in TG are different. Yeah. Well, what is the T in TG? In TC, it's technical committee, and in TG, it's task group. Task oh. group. Thank oh. you. I actually did not know that, or I have forgotten that. Okay. Um, okay, so um, uh, does anybody, has anybody else been at all involved in anything that's happened with the security task group since that initial spurt of activity? Okay. I just keep poking, keep poking Michael. I haven't heard anything back. Michael Saboff? Uh, Fakara. Michael Fakara, okay. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that um, uh, I think if this group does happen, uh, you know, the, this group here, our CES group, is not at all CES, you know, specific to CES per se. It's about all sorts of security relevant JavaScript topics. Um, I think um, that uh, one thing we should discuss is whether we just move a lot of our conversations under a different banner and basically just con continue these meetings under that banner. Um, uh, I would certainly not like to add 
yet more habitual meetings to my own schedule. Uh, this two hour a week slot is something that I, you know, I'm already not able to always catch. And it's very, this one's very important to me. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, one, what the, what essentially the proposal is, is, you know, one level, we just declare ourselves to be TG, yes. to be TG3. Uh, um, and when that has been floated, um, there have been a few people who kind of reacted a little kind of mm, to that. Um, I think it, it may end up by de facto becoming that because these committees are pretty much defined as the committee constitutes whoever shows up for the committee meetings. Right. Um, if we just start, you know, if, if the people who are showing up there is essentially this group and we just discuss JavaScript security issues that we would normally discuss here, discuss it there, then those well, I think, are just I, 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 labeling this meeting. I perceive, this is perception, that there's a desire to discuss security issues that are outside of the scope of things that we typically concern ourselves with. Um, um, I know for whatever reason we don't concern ourselves with them, either because we think those are wrong-headed ways of doing security or because they're just out of scope for our mission. Um, but whatever that is, I think there was a sense um, that, that people wanted to form to talk about those things, whatever those things are, and I'm unclear on what those are. So it okay. might be worth having a conversation with Michael. Okay, good. I'm clear on one of them. I've only, I only heard one thing that I understood that falls into that category. And I think the only reason we haven't discussed it here is it's never just been the priority thing to discuss, um, not because it's in any way outside of our interests, uh, which is uh, Natalie has shown that the high performance JavaScript entries, the ones with the JITs, uh, have lots of memory and safety problems. And the reason why they do is because uh, JavaScript has many, many peculiar things uh, that enable um, uh, create a case explosion of trying to optimize uh, what should be on fast paths. And given the pressure on the implementers to make the fast paths fast, um, rather than than you know, rather than to make them correct, um, uh, they often uh, miss some obscure parts of that case explosion. Um, uh, so, uh, so what I heard was a, a strong desire to uh, reduce the case explosion. On the one hand, that came up at the last TC39 meeting. Uh, but also avoid adding things to the case explosion um, uh, in order to make the implementer's job easier and less likely to introduce new memory unsafeties. And I think all of that is completely uh, within uh, the appropriate agenda for this group. Well, I think, I think yes, although I think one of the things that comes up in that context is the the use of, of uh, process boundaries as an isolation mechanism. Um, and one way to think of process boundaries there is a way to limit the blast radius of exploits of memory unsafety, um, which I think actually there's a lot of kind of well-grounded common sense in that. Um, I'm a little bit more put off by kind of a, well, we can't do this correctly, but we know all those Linux process guys can do whatever it is they're doing correctly, which kind of frightens me a little bit. Um, the presumption that this other problem that's in some other set of developers domain, you know, we're just not going to worry about it. We're going to assume they did their job right. is exactly the, the, the approach that a lot of other people are taking to the memory safety of JavaScript. Um, and uh, I think one issue, one, one question there is, uh, um, I'd be curious to know more about these these sort of violations of memory safety that have been found because it seems like every one of those is an exploitable hole for somebody to do yeah. something terrible, even with yeah. process isolation. Yes, yes, uh, that's that's why they're considering it to be a high priority to try to reduce their frequency and not produce more. Uh, they so, they definitely do not like having uh, memory unsafety holes in JavaScript. 
Yeah, kind of. They are definitely prioritized for web browsers. We know of a few memory on safety things that have outstanding uh, patches that aren't landing uh, oh. because browsers don't use APIs the ways that some server uh, hosts do. Wow. Um, so there's definitely, I feel, a good reason to get people involved and maybe they don't feel like they want to join an existing group for whatever reason. Um, I think if we want to co-opt it, however, that seems fine to me. Um, but the clear thing with this group in particular is we do have outside uh, guests, which I'm unclear if a task group could sustain that. I understand, what do you mean by sustain? Uh, My understanding keep, is task group meetings going. are open to anybody that the task group cares to have attending. Um, I, I would agree. I just don't know if whatever we're chartering would have that agreement. Okay. It's certainly, I, you know, I, uh, I consider it to be a requirement uh, for our habitual meetings uh, that we have people outside TC39 here. Uh, you guys, um, uh, many, of who, many of you are on the call right now have been extremely valuable. And, and um, if we can't move the whole group to a different label, then we're not going to move to the, to the other. There, 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 there might be, I think the one, one constraint there, and, and, and I guess Daniel has, has, has uh, drifted away from the conversation because he might be able to speak to this. Um, Daniel, if you're there, speak up. Uh, is, is if it's an official ECMA uh, thing, then it may be a requirement that people who aren't uh, ECMA uh, delegates have to sign the, the, the whatever it's called, the, the IP release form that says, yes, I'm not going to try to claim ownership on any of our discussions here, um, which, which I hope is not a big hurdle, but it would be a formal process boundary that we'd, we'd be imposing on people. Alex, when I had you attend the ECMAScript meeting, the TC39 meeting, where we co-presented on membranes, uh, you were attending as an invited expert, which is an official uh, ECMA designation. Uh, did right. they have to sign any kind of release in order to do that? Do you remember? I do remember that I had to for that. Um, I don't remember what it was. Okay. Yeah, as I understand it, it's basically just a an agreement that you will you will essentially obey comedy and not and not attempt to uh, run off and gain exclusive you know IP rights to something that you overheard. Yeah, the the two times I attended as an invited expert, in neither case was I asked to sign a form. But I think this may have been in the wild west days of TC thirty nine when. <laughs> Oh, because I'm pretty sure I wasn't supposed to even attend more than once. Yeah, the pro processes have gotten more, more <laughs> codified. Um, yeah, when I was uh, when I attended as an inv invited expert, I was I, the rules said I could attend twice, that time and one other time. I haven't used the second one, obviously. Um, well, there there are lots of weasel clauses in the various rules that it's it's effectively easy to work around. Um, uh, I've gone through various periods between jobs when I did not have any formal corporate sponsorship and I continued attending TC39 meetings and basically Isfan just said, oh yeah, you should be here. And that was all it took. Um, um, and so I'm kind of, uh, maybe this is just showing my privilege, but this just, uh, I don't, worry about that. Yeah, I, I would be happy with that kind of informal, um, you know, informal arrangement as long as we get to actually meet the way we want to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I imagine I, that the, I imagine that topics at that meeting may in uh, may include um, modules in the same origin policy or something like that. Uh, I suppose that we will want to be there. Uh, yeah, there, there will be, 
discussions about security models unrelated to object capabilities, uh, but are still language relevant or may become language relevant. Yeah, fortunately, nobody, uh, including even Chrome team, has suggested trying to get language support for the same origin model. What would that even mean? Uh, I, I don't, no, no, let's not even talk about that. I, I don't, I, I don't even want to hear a rhetorical question. Thank you, Jeff. That, that. <laughs> Man, a rhetorical question. <laughs> All right, well, we have uh, 20 minutes left in our uh, calendar time. Um, what's on right. the agenda? Yeah, that's uh, guards, our records, tuples, or objects, and reified name, and what powers should it have? Uh, so some of those things are really only productively discussed with Dan here. Uh, uh, Dan, checking in again, are you here? It is. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. I, I uh, oh. Phil, I, yeah, I'm here. OK, yeah. great. Your, it's your very, name was invoked on several occasions with no response, so we, we weren't sure what. I'm so sorry. I uh, I think I um, I didn't sleep well last night, and I I fell asleep and just woke up. So I um, yeah, very sorry about that. But what what was our conclusion about the acceptable? <laughs> no, it was a very interesting topic. But what was our uh, conclusion about this uh, same key topic? That it's, it's feasible uh, as a direction or what? So I don't know that we arrived at a conclusion per se, uh, but I certainly uh, felt like everything was very positive on this as that discussion concluded, yeah. Well, I feel like um, 20 minutes is just not gonna be enough time for us to do a full treatment of records and tuples as objects versus uh, identityless objects versus primitives. So, you know, that's a topic I really want to discuss, but I feel like we might, maybe we should just go to another topic because the others, and I would, and in particular, I was thinking about guards because I'm just really excited about that topic. Like I read the, the old pages about it and um, I've just been thinking about it a lot. And so I'm curious if you could, um, if we could, if people would feel like talking about that. Yeah, uh, I would certainly, um, uh, you know, like talking about that. It's, um, uh, we, have, so, we as a group have not talked about it for, I'm not sure ever, but certainly not for a long time. So let me back up and explain what uh, my kind of interest is. I've been curious about how, well, two, two things that I think guards kind of relate to. One thing is uh, typed objects in the WebAssembly GC proposal. So like how, how we could have objects with a fixed kind of shape that would be more optimizable and more typable with a predictable memory layout. And I feel like guards make sense as a, as a kind of part of that, both that they would maybe have guards in them for the fields, but also form their own guard so that they could maybe be used as a field of something else in a, in a typed way. I'm not sure if this is what guards were intended for. Uh, well, it, it's uh, certainly within the, within the range of what guards are intended for. Uh, it wasn't the, it was not the emphasis. Okay. No, I, yeah. The, the other thing is, which maybe is closer to the, the emphasis of guards, the, the use for sort of higher integrity at, at API boundaries, where you can, you would have the parameters and return values be, be guarded. So then it could provide more kind of certainty. Right. And um, I was also wondering about kind of the relationship with, with unsound type systems like TypeScript. If we had, if guards could were sort of typable in the sense of 
interacting well with, with those systems. Because I think there's demand for types that that work well with those systems, but then also have runtime semantics. So wonder was wondering if you had thoughts about how guards would fit into those kinds of things or if they wouldn't or things like that. So uh, TypeScript is a, um, you know, there's this whole typing theory uh, of TypeScript uh, that has to do with, uh, you know, type checking all the parameterized types and all that. Uh, and I don't know that theory. Um, uh, I know that it's, you know, it's as with many types, many fancy type systems, it has its origin in Henley Milner, but I just, I just don't know the specifics of TypeScript. Um, the easy case that all of these have in common uh, is just tag checking of the root. So, you know, if, if you want to know uh, is something an array of T for some arbitrary T, then you have to look then at runtime, you'd have to look inside the array. But if you just want to know, is it an array? And then later, when you go to use something from the array, you want to know, is that particular thing a T? Uh, then you could do that essentially by just shallow tag checking. Um, uh, so one of the things that uh, Waldemar and I, um, uh, in, in the combination of the types, sorry, a combination of the guards and the trademarks. marks, is the guards are a general mechanism. You can write a guard to check something shallowly or deeply. Uh, but then uh, the trademarking mechanism is specifically for declaring shallow constraints and then doing a tag check to verify a shallow constraint in constant time. So we definitely had a part of our design center there was that the guards generated by a trademark declaration, which is essentially an interface declaration, uh, that those only introduce constant time checks to your program. And the idea was that um, uh, there's this very, very bad history of hybrid type systems where people introduce uh, uh, type checks into dynamic languages um, where you're mixing typed and untyped code which is if you're trying to do, let's say a boundary where you're doing a full verification of a, of a deep static type on data that had not yet been tagged, you have to do this deep walk of the data, which is you know, linear in the size of the data. And then people have tried all sorts of crazy optimization tricks around that, uh, which have generally not worked out well uh, to the point where um, uh, hybrid types where you've got soundness of the check types in an overall untyped context has gotten a bad rep performance wise. Um, and if you're doing yeah. just, just the tag checking of the root, then that's introducing only a constant time overhead and it can be a very small constant. That, that sounds like important important kind of motivation. I'm concerned about these performance properties as, as well. Yeah. Uh, but more, I had, I had some kind of concrete questions about trademarks. Like, yeah. uh, you know, we, the, the trademark uh, wiki entry was written before we added private fields and methods. And there's been all this discussion of private fields and methods as being brand checks themselves. So I was wondering if we could come up with sort of a unified theory that would encompass trademarks and private fields as if the trademark represents the existence of the private fields. This would imply though that trademarks would not be proxy transparent. And so I was kind of curious if that would match or contradict your intention with, with trademarks. Was the idea that they would be proxy transparent or or how would that work? I don't remember. I think these are excellent questions. And uh, to a large extent, uh, in the modern JavaScript era, I have not revisited our thinking about trademarks and guards. So I had a, you know, I've, I've been thinking about how typed objects would relate to the WebAssembly GC proposal. And so in, in particular, this proxy transparency question comes up. And so concretely, 
the WebAssembly GC proposal, so I, I was kind of hoping that typed objects could have a data model that's in correspondence with the WebAssembly GC proposal. I, I think it could be really good to review that proposal like with this group because it it has the WebAssembly GC proposal is basically, you know, WebAssembly is basically another programming language. And the WebAssembly GC proposal is a language of instructions for creating and manipulating heap allocated data structures. And it has a very nice clean type system. And so, you know, it's all, it's all completely sound. There's downcasts, but they're very sort of concretely easily checkable and evaluable. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that was actually one of the things that was coming to mind when I was talking about the constant time tag checks is that all of the downcasting WebAssembly was very purposely defined to be only a constant time shallow tag check. Yes, and with the WebAssembly GC proposal preserves that by, uh, you have, uh, you know, it has single inheritance objects based on these RTTs, which are runtime types, which uh, it uses this optimization mechanism for single inheritance object languages, where you sort of have an array of uh, an array of tags, and you can check if one type is a subtype of another because each one is represented as um, an array of all of its super types uh, by the depth in the inheritance hierarchy. So to check if one thing is a subtype of another thing, all you have to check is, well, if one is longer than the other, then does it at its index equal what the other one is? Because it, you're checking is one a prefix of the other. Anyway, so, so the WebAssembly GC proposal sort of includes this pattern. But another thing that the WebAssembly GC proposal includes is, well, it doesn't, it doesn't include proxies. So it doesn't include that there's distinct identities that are in the same, that would, that would have the same underlying memory and be in the same type, which is kind of key to the proxies. So concretely, uh, you can have one struct that includes another struct as a, as a field. And when you get that inner struct out of the outer struct, then you can directly know that the struct field is at a particular offset. So this is a notion of typing, which is not friendly to proxy transparency. If we were to represent it directly in JavaScript. So I've kind of curious, you know, it's a useful implementation property because that way you don't have to do an extra type check when you get this object out. If you're trying to represent something like Java, then it's it's appropriate to have this kind of type system because they don't because they don't have proxies. So but I'm just thinking about if we can make JavaScript also fit into this or if this would face this as sort of a, a fatal issue that you couldn't put a proxy in because you would have to jump up to you know the the any type of sort of the, the universal type when you want to use proxies because you don't know these these details. Does the question make sense? Uh, I think so. This is all um, this is all new to me. Um, the uh, in general with JavaScript, the way we've been approaching a lot of you know, virtualization issues is it's okay if virtualization throws you on the slow path. Um, uh, uh, so instead of, so as these concepts appear in JavaScript, I would hope, you know, I would very much you know, want to constrain them to preserve the virtues of proxies, but the kind of implementation optimizations that you have in mind, those are for the fast path. It would be okay if uh, when these things are being um, virtualized, if you lose the benefits of the fast path. So I guess when we're thinking about the context of typed objects, typed objects kind of have 
reliably good performance. So when you're writing WebAssembly code, you get this reliably good performance and these reliably fast uh, struct field accesses. Then we have a question about whether we want this capability to be exposed just through WebAssembly or whether we also want to make it so that JavaScript code can also access this reliable, you know, performance reliability in a more direct way than, you know, writing the, all this WebAssembly code to, to be able to call out to it. That's sort of the, the design question, whether we want to consider this thing to be sort of in scope for the language. And this ends up being, I think this ends up being kind of the same as the trademark uh, proxy, you know, the trademark is the trademark being checked on the proxy target or is it just being checked shallowly? Because if the trademark is being checked shallowly, it does kind of correspond. So oh, I tried to raise my hand and um, let's say, yes, we want uh, JavaScript to kind of get into the WebAssembly benefits of structures and um, I guess if nobody else objects, we should, yes, please do that. <laughs> Can you say like why? Well, the whole idea of, um, of being able to use JavaScript uh, with the power of WebAssembly to do computational science and get rid of all these um, Java inspired uh, things like MATLAB um, that basically um, come with a big price tag, which you could get for free if JavaScript did that. Um, this this whole area of you know moving away from from things that are more than two decades old and bringing that to the web finally um, would really be where um, I would love to see um, you know the web going personally. Um, I think it, it opens up um, a lot of possibilities um, that are currently only being met by tools that are either too expensive or um, old or both. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm excited about this too. Uh, I feel like I haven't given a very clear exposition of the of this kind of conflict that I'm trying to piece out. Would people be open to discussing this further in a future meeting if I brought, you know, more more clear materials to to discuss it? Uh, I think that this sounds like a, a very big and important topic. Uh, it's one that I'm, um, uh, it's sort of, I'm, I'm feeling one of those cognitive dissonance things where Two things, both of which I've thought about, uh, are meeting each other for the first time. It seems like I haven't thought about them together before. Um, uh, but yeah, this is a big and important topic. And I think um, uh, having a meeting, which this is the central topic, which starts off with an extended presentation by you, if you're willing to do that, uh, I think that would be great. I'd second that uh, simply because it sounded like I heard three or four different concepts uh, colliding, and, and I'm totally lost on the last 10 minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely try to make this more clear next time, and I'm excited to, to bring this to a future meeting. But I also do want to come back to the uh, record and tuple object question as well, and then all these other things that we had queued this meeting and didn't get to. Yeah. So. Always good to have an agenda ready for the next week before that week happens. Um, the um, yeah, thank you everybody. I'm going to turn off the recording. We have a few more minutes.